All right, dude. First of all, you get called up. We were supposed to do this on Tuesday. Yeah. What was that moment like for you? Second time you got called up, right? Second time, place? yeah. So what was that moment like for you? It was, I mean, it was super spontaneous. I think that made it, that made it much better because we, we were flying back from uh, Salt Lake on Monday. And as soon as we land, we, we landed at like five. Then I got a call from, uh, from my manager, which he was in the flight with me. <laughs> and it's like, hey, so, uh, yeah, you're getting called up. You uh, get your bags and go to Bush. Uh, we flew to Hobby. Get a, go to Bush real quick because your, your flight leaves in two hours. So I'm like, oh, wow. Like, I'm, like, running around, like, stressed but excited, stressed about getting my bags, I'm gonna, if I'm going to make the flight. But it was – it was a different experience from last year. Last year, I made the opening day roster, and this year was like, like this, right? Did not expect it, and so it was cool. I mean, we were in, we just got back from San Francisco uh, last night, so yeah, it was it was cool. So when you get called up, what's the biggest difference outside of the baseball aspect? Mm -hmm. Like, is it what's the best part of being in the bigs? Is it the hotel, the flights, the spread in the clubhouse? Like, you what name it, it, you name it, all the above. <laughs> it's a little, it's a little different, a little upgrade from uh, from the minors, but. It's just all that, the way the way you get, man, the way you get treated, like the way everything is just so easy for you. Like they make they make playing baseball just your your main thing to focus. Like you don't have to worry about anything else. But yeah, spreads a little. The, the food is a little bit different than in the minors. <laughs> what do you <laughs> so, get in the minors versus what you get in? Oh, minors. It's uh, when we're on the road. Uh, although in Sugarland, they do a very good job of feeding us they we have we have a kitchen we have chefs like they do a really good job of feeding us but in the road so yeah man tuesday chipotle that's that's a that's a given and just our dietitian just has, tries to be tries to get creative with what to get us for post game like different foods like like let's say we go to El Paso, we eat a we eat a lot of Mexican but good food, but then we go to some places that they don't have much variety, so it's like you get tired of it. But there's some places that have better better food or better spread than others. Who's got the best spread in the, that you've had? El Paso just because of the Mexican food, man. Yeah. It's good. Although Salt Lake has really had really good restaurants, our dietitian really did a good job of finding like good good spots. You've got a pretty wild story coming come to America playing ball. Yeah. By the way, English nails. Thank you. Appreciate it. How so? How did that kind of come about? How'd you learn English? Well, when I moved to when I moved to the States, I was sixteen, and my my host family they didn't speak any Spanish, right? So I I put myself in that uncomfortable situation, which was, dude, I gotta I gotta learn I gotta learn how to communicate, right? <laughs> and I was going to school, and not very many people speak uh, spoke Spanish, but I also made an made a conscious effort of not going to find people that spoke Spanish. Like I wanted to throw myself out there, which it was hard. I mean, I had no no confidence in myself because I didn't speak the language, but I was I was trying. And also, I mean, all the books I read, the shows I watched, movies, always tried to watch them in English with subtitles so I can like follow along and just learn it. What shows taught you English? <sighs> Man, just kids show, I was 16 years old. It's, SpongeBob, like just yeah. a bunch of kids shows, man. <laughs> and also movies, like I rewatched the Rocky movies a lot, and uh, by the my favorite movies of all time. So I just rewatched them one through six, right, and just in English. So just follow along, and then just you know, just speaking, just trying to speak it. I mean, I probably sounded very dumb back in the day, but <laughs> it helped me a lot. Take me through the decision to come up to America, sixteen years old, lead your family, and be like, I'm gonna chase this. What probably people thought was a wild, crazy dream. Yeah, I mean, even myself, I thought it was, for a long time, I thought it was a wild, crazy dream. But I, I wanted to take another, uh, another route, which wasn't the correct route for Mexican baseball players. Because I, there, like, all we know is you got to sign with a professional contract with the Mexican team. You got to perform at, they send you to different leagues at age 15, 16. And if you perform well and a, a scout likes you, you will get signed, right? But they take, they take away their education. And that's something that my family always prioritized. They didn't, did not want me to do that. And obviously, like, I was, I was upset because I saw kids that I played with or against that I'm, I knew I was better than them, but they were getting signed by Mexican professional teams. And I wasn't getting signed. I wasn't getting any love from them. But 
little did I know that when those teams approached my dad, my dad was always like, no, like we were going to prioritize education. And the idea come to start, uh, come to start. And now to this day, my mentor hitting coach slash my second dad, Luis mm-hmm. Valenzuela, met him when I was 12 years old. And he started like throwing the idea of, hey, I can help you guys uh, go to the States and, you know, so, uh, go to high school and see if we can get a college scholarship. And he hooked it up with the family, and the rest is history. I mean, I, it's the best decision I could have made. When did you come to realization that your parents were right and you, you did the right route? When I when I got the call by by the University of Arizona telling me I got they they wanted they wanted to offer me a scholarship, I was like, I remember I started watching like the College World Series and college baseball a little bit more, and I was like, damn, like. That is, that is cool. Like, I want to be in, the, in, in this spot. Like, I want to be in this scenario. And it happened that my freshman year, we went to the College World Series, right? But once I got to campus, I'm like, this is the right decision. Like, baseball is great. Player, uh, player development is great. And I'm having fun just living the college experience, like meeting new people, uh, hanging out with my baseball guys, hanging out with people outside the baseball. Like, I, I, had, I had such a good life outside baseball, too. So that made it so much better. I don't know like what your goals were coming over here, but it's interesting because the goal is always, I'm sure at one point was just to get to the United States, just mm-hmm. to get to college yeah. and then just get to the pros and then just get to the bigs. And then, yeah. So where do your, what was your goal? And now where do your goals sit? Cause I, you surely have accomplished quite a bit of what you wanted to mm-hmm. initially. My goal, as soon as I got to the States, I wanted to get a college scholarship. I did not want to sign after high school. I felt like I wasn't ready. And also I, from reading and knowing the importance of college and, Back in the day, I think from every big league team, from all 30 big league teams, around 70% of the players were uh, were college, uh, went to college, right? Mm-hmm. So I knew the importance of it. So the, the, the first goal was to get a college scholarship. Obviously, like I didn't, I didn't have a preference, but obviously wanted to go D1. But if I went a different route, like so be it. And if, if that was my ceiling, like at least I'm going to have a college education, right? But... I knew that I knew that wasn't gonna be my silly, but yeah, it was college uh, or college scholarship, and after that, like I'm like, I want more, you know. So started performing well and starting getting some love from scouts, and I saw the possibility of getting drafted. And well, when did the big leagues become a goal? It's always been a dream, right? right. It's always as a little kid. Like, I mean, I had that dream. That yeah. dream got <laughs> dumped on real quick. No, but. it's uh, it's always had that dream, but. My my junior year of college, I really like, and also that this goal it was due to the the preparation, the work ethic I had, the people around me, and just seeing like the, the seeing the competition, right? I was like, I think I can I can make it, right? I just need a shot. I just need an opportunity. And thankful for the Astros, they drafted me in the twenty eighteen uh, twenty eighteen draft, and. I, th- I think my junior year in college became like a strong goal. Like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go all into this. Right. So when did you think that you had a chance to get to the bigs? Like, when were you like, all right, I'm going to get this. Ever since I got drafted, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, ever since I got drafted, you have to have that mentality. You can't show any weakness, but I won't lie to you and say that I always thought it was attainable. Uh, there was some, there was some days and some seasons that I was like, I don't know if I can, I don't know if this is even a possibility anymore, but in 2021, which I had, I broke my jaw, missed two. Uh, How'd missed, you do that? I got hit by baseball. At the, at the plate? No, it was catching, man. It was catching. Foul ball? It was, so I was warming up. I was in the bullpen and I had a two-piece mask and you know, they have, they don't have anything covering yeah, the sides. Which, I love those, by the way. I, Me you, too, but I can't wear them anymore. <laughs> no kidding. And, uh. It was my fault. Like I, instead of blocking a baseball, I try to like, uh, I try to scoop it, and I turn my hand just enough oh, and nick yeah. me right in the side. You laid it. Yeah, I laid it, and then you, you got lazy. Well. Yeah, you I didn't want to get down. It was my, and, yeah, it was my fault, and I uh, broke my jaw. Had to had a jaw reconstruction. It was it was tough, and I missed two months, the first two months of the season, and that was probably like a, probably the darkest darkest moment of my life. So I was like. Damn, I just missed two months. Like I'm, I'm in the older side already. Like I'm in, 
I was in low A when I was 24 years old. Like, man, I don't know if this is going to be a possibility. And then I just missed two months of the season. And when I came back, like, I was I was a third catcher in high A. Like, I, was, I wasn't playing much. Uh, and then an opportunity came in double A where somebody got hurt. They called me up, but I wasn't catching. I was just there for, like, for – for backup, basically. Mm-hmm. Somebody got hurt in double A and me and my double A manager, like we got we got pretty close and he was like, Hey, I'm I don't wanna I don't wanna call anybody up, like I want you I want you to play. So I started playing second base. Like that was that was how it started. I started playing second base, man, and I started performing very well. I was getting I was getting to catch a little more and then uh, one of our catchers got called up, so I was getting more I was getting more playing time behind the plate, and I was performing very well, uh, especially hitting. So, I after that, like I finished with a strong season, twenty two, uh, carried that same momentum, had a really good season, and uh, twenty three. I mean, had a good spring, and like I told, like I told you before, there's like I made opening day roster. It was it was cool. Like I, everything like I remember the times that I was like, I don't I don't know if this is gonna be even possible it just makes it so much better you know when you broke your jaw and you're going through the time of i don't know if i'm ever gonna make it like mm-hmm. what made you stick with it what made you not quit the people around me especially my dad Luis Venezuela, my family like i i said i'm gonna put all all in right i'm gonna go all into this and if that's if that's my ceiling and, and that's where if that's where i got that's where i got right but i wasn't gonna I wasn't going to go down without at least giving it a shot, at least giving it a fight. So, and it happened that, I mean, that darkest moment of my life ended up being what turned my career around just because I was just, after that, I was just, I was just more grateful of, hey, this can be taken, taken away like this, right? So might as well just, just enjoy it. Even it's easier said than done, but that was always in my head. Like I'm, I'm enjoying the moment. I'm enjoying where I'm at playing or not. Like, I'm just going to enjoy my journey. And that translated to performance. And that trans- translated into me being a big leaguer. What's going through your head when you're in the big leagues, just sitting in the cl- just sitting in the dugout during the game, just taking it all in? Like, how many times can you just take it in versus your tick that you're not playing? Because uh-huh. I'm sure that, fl- that switch will flip eventually as well. It was surreal. Like, I, there's no words. There's no words to describe it. It's... I remember when I when Dana Brown told me the news, like I started crying, like around the spot, and it's just a roller coaster of emotions, and it's I don't know how to describe it in words. And honestly, it did not hit me until the first road trip, or the first road trip, like if the first like taste of being a big leaguer, like traveling, like I was like, damn, this is this is the big leagues, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's just a surreal moment, and called cried, and then called my family. I was like, I'm not going to cry in front of them. I'm like, I'm going to be strong. And no, they, we all started crying together. So it was, it was cool. What, when you mentioned about the, this Dan is the big leagues traveling, what's like the number one thing? Like, is there a mint on your pillow? What, what is it that is just, no. just, so just remember, the best part? I remember I was talking to Jeremy Pena, right? And I asked him like, hey, so where do I, where do I take my, where do I take my, uh, my suitcase? It, it started with the suitcase. And he goes, no, just park. Just leave the su- leave the suitcase by your car, and you'll you'll get it in Minnesota in your room. I'm like, what do you mean in your room? Yeah, like it's gonna be waiting in your room for you, like in the lobby. In the in the lobby, like they're gonna give it to me. No, no, no just don't worry about your su- don't worry about your suitcase. <laughs> then we fly. I mean, charter like great food in the plane, like no no peanuts from uh, United or <laughs> Southwest, and. uh yeah, I got to my room and my suitcase was my suitcase was waiting for me in my room. So I'm like, wow, like he was right. he was right, like he was legit. Like just wait till your room, then and the suitcase is gonna be there. But that's just a funny story that I did not believe him, but it was it was true. Like and th- those little things that I mentioned to you, like they just make it so much easier for you to focus on just baseball. Like you don't have to worry about anything else, right? Did you ever have to like hold yourself back, like when you were in the clubhouse, like, not trying to FaceTime your friends or take videos of the guys or anything like that? Just the no, amenities. No, I was I was always very conscious about that. I was the the biggest thing for me was I mean I see Jordan Alvarez right next to me, El Tuve, like Bregman, like talking to all these guys. Like I'm in the same clubhouse as all these guys. I'm like, 
all right, like, I'm not a fan. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm on the team, right? Like, I'm, I'm here to do my job and help this team win. Mm -hmm. So that was a, I think that was the hardest part. Like, it's just like realizing and hey, like, I'm in, the, I'm in the same team as them. Like, I, I belong here, right? I'm not. Obviously, like, I respect their careers. Like, I idolize them, but just like, okay, I'm here. I'm gonna do my job, and I'm gonna help these. I'm gonna help all these guys win as much as they want to help this team win too. So I think that was the hardest part. What was your moment in a game when you're like, "Damn, this is different than AAA. Like these guys are just a little bit better." Remember doing my scouting report for um, for Minnesota because so I got I I was told that I was gonna get the start on April 5th, which was my dad's birthday, and my family was there. I was making the scouting report, and I'm like, Byron Buxton, Carlos Correa, Max Kepler. I'm like, I'm scouting for these guys that I'm, you know, I've been wa I've been watching watching them on TV, right, and played the show with them. Um, and uh, so I remember my first at bat, it didn't really hit me yet. It hit me the first inning that I caught at home. I that's when my heart really started racing. Oh. And you know the first it it is it all soaked uh, soaked when I blocked my first ball. I remember I blocked my first ball. I'm like, okay, I've done this a million times. I've done this. I know how to do this. Just go out there and play the game. Yeah. Once you start reacting versus yeah. thinking, that's when it also. I mean, at any level, whether it's playing quarterback, the first time I would take a hit. It's like, uh, right? We're yeah, good. we're good. Like, we're good. Right, here. Yeah. Like it's all the same type mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, how much when you how much of a responsibility do you feel as a catcher when you, especially when you get called up being mm -hmm. like, like this is for real. Their start is on my, is in my hands. I need to study 10 mm -hmm. times harder. Yeah. I need to let them know. But at the same time, they've been here forever. I don't want to mm -hmm. tell them something that they're not comfortable with. Like yeah. the responsibility as a catcher in the big leagues is huge. It is. I mean, you, you take control of the whole game. Right. And also I felt like I didn't do, a lot more than what I did in the past because they in 22 I remember they we started implementing a scout report for the opposing hitters right and a, a detailed scout report so I had that practice in all 2022 and I took pride of it because I the pitcher success is my success too right mm -hmm. and if the pitcher fails like I see it as my failure so I wanted I always wanted to be the best prepare that I can before every game in double A. And I would and the pitchers the, the difference is the pitchers there are still the pitchers in the minor leagues are still new to the scouting report. They still m more tend to not trust the catcher. And in the bigs they they have their own plan. Like they do their own research. Now they're we're doing a much better job in the in the minors of implementing that to the pitchers and just telling them, hey, just take a look, right? But I, I was just the same scouting report, same information. I had a baseline of how to attack each hitter. And every time we have, every time we, uh, we play, we have, before every game, we have a pitcher and catcher meeting. And it was more of a ideas like, hey, I see that this guy struggles with this, this pitch. This can be the kill pitch. Let's avoid, let's avoid this pitch. And it was, it was cool because we have the same, we had the same information, right? So I felt like, I don't have to do I don't have to do more. I just gotta keep doing what I've been doing for the last year. Right. So that was that was a cool moment. Martin Maldonado was famous mm -hmm. for the amount of studying that he had. Pitchers love throwing to him. Yeah. Part of the reason he's not on the roster today is because pitchers will want to throw to him every single time just because of how prepared that he is. Mm -hmm. So they, they had to have him out of the clubhouse. Did you learn anything particular from him? I did. I mean, he, he would call us to his room. He would call me and Yiner to his room on the road and just do scouting reports together. We did. He he used the different techniques. I I'm more of a visual guy. Like I like heat maps. He likes numbers. Mm -hmm. So I I would do I would be next to him writing with my writing my scanner report based on heat maps. He was next to me writing based on numbers. But I would always obviously take a peek. Like okay, oh I missed this. See it. See his notes, and then just compare notes and. After after every uh, after we were done, and I always made uh, always made a made a conscious effort of being in pitchers and catchers meeting before 
every game when he was when he was catching and it was the just the confidence that he transmitted to the pitcher while talking about the opposing lineup i think make made it so much better like he was hey this is gonna be the kill pitch hey this guy swings and misses 30 something percent of the time at this pitch hey we can get this guy to ground ball if there's a man on a man on first and we need a ground ball we can throw this pitch get a ground ball like it was so detailed and obviously learned a lot from that and now i'm implementing more okay I'm, i have my heat maps i have my visuals but now if we get into a jam what is my go-to pitch so now i get i go to the system that he used and just go from there and then there's the mental side of a catcher yeah. so as a pitcher i was not very good clearly hence i'm here talking to you about <laughs> pitching at one point in my life but i needed a catcher that would hype me up like he was my damn therapist out there at mm -hmm. times like you need just i don't care if my curveball is flat tell me it was nasty yeah like tell me how good it's, i am it's today. funny it's funny that you mentioned that because you as a catcher you gotta know your pitcher's personalities mm -hmm. right you gotta learn which pitcher you have to hype up which pitcher you have to get get on them in which pitchers you have to like just give a pat on the back and be like hey man we're good yeah. so i think that's one of the beauties about being a catcher just learning the different personalities and I, I, funny they mentioned like last week uh, i don't know if you've heard the name aj blue yeah, yeah 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 for falling down in spring yeah, yeah, yeah great dude mm -hmm. great pitcher and we me and him gotten have gotten really close and He's one of the pitchers that he needs the tough love, right? So I remember we got on a, we got into a jam in the fourth, and I'm like, they they got somebody warming up in the pen. I'm like, man, I want you to finish this inning. Like, don't let the don't let the manager take you out. Finish this inning, but with other words, right? Yeah, <laughs> other yeah, words yeah, that yeah, I can't yeah, use. Yeah. And uh, he ended up striking the two the the two next guys the 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 next two guys, right? And uh, is it that you build that with trust? You build that mm -hmm. with the just hanging out with the guys getting to know them and it was just funny it was just a funny example now that you mentioned like you needed the hey man that was nasty even though it was flat and it was just like like that but uh yeah it's just knowing the the knowing your pitchers knowing their personalities knowing how to get how to get the best out of them like every body movement a catcher makes i would read into if i wasn't having a good day like if he shakes his head like what the hell is this guy doing I, I, bro i don't want to see that i can't yeah. see that right now uh -huh. i need you to tell me how good i am and like you pumping up aj i can feel it now like i want to run off the mound like yeah, yeah. I was, like grab you by the yeah. chest protector and be like that was all you like i don't mm -hmm. know what it was but all you you for get sure. credit for those two outs yeah and it's like and also you, as a catcher I'm, I'm a very passionate guy like i I'm a very emotional guy, and the, something that I struggled earlier in my career was not letting my emotions take control and not showing my emotions. Yeah, that's tough. So it is tough, and I've I've run into times, even even nowadays, and I'm like, like I'm showing a little too much emotion, and I now I'm conscious. And I'm like, okay, just reset. The pitcher needs you. The team needs you. Get let's get back on right. But uh, I have to really make a conscious effort. Now that you mentioned, like the, you, you, you paid a lot of attention of the catcher movements and the catcher's Always. body language. So I know now that it's something that really affects a pitcher, right? So and a whole team. Like mm -hmm. as a catcher, you're everybody's looking at you. Like outfielders are looking at you. Infielders are looking at you. So you have to be so emotionally strong and like just neutral, like or positive. And the catcher yeah, knows everything too. So like if something's wrong with the pitcher, the catcher knows and then a, one, a hitter can see it, two, the fielders can see it, and three, even worse, the pitcher sees like, yeah. dang, if he sees it can't then. Bury, like, you can't bury the pitcher with, no. your, with your body language. That's, and it's coming back to being emotionally strong and emotionally neutral, right? Yeah, like just complete plant face. Like yeah. it reminds me of like Eli Manning or Jay Cutler and they like fans get on and they show no emotion. It's like, there's a reason, man. Like you got to go in that huddle, even keel after every single yeah. time. You can't get too high and you can't get too low. It's the same thing with a catcher. Mm -hmm. Just like Martin Maldonado, even yeah. even times when we were the we we were not doing great. Like you see the same him, and when when we were doing great, you see the same him, right? It would drive me crazy when fans would jump on Marty because, listen, I know he wasn't a great hitter. Like the numbers are what they are, mm -hmm. but what he did for that team and did for that staff, you will never be able to to. No. To and, put it into numbers, ever. And, and those are people that they don't know the insides of it. They mm -hmm. don't know how much value he brings to a team, not only a pitching staff, but to a team because of his leadership. He's a better. He's been around for a while, so 
he would not only talk to pitchers, but also talk to hitters about approaches. Like, hey, you should look at this pitcher. He has this tip on this situation. Look to do this, especially with the younger guys, you know, so. Okay, so there were parts of the conversation that we had to edit out, but you can watch it now live on Fox Local. Just scroll down, find it, click on it, watch the rest of it. Plus, it's also going to be available on YouTube as well. Let me know what you thought of the interview in the comments section, as well as on X at Will Kunkel Fox. All right, next week, we'll have another fresh episode of Kicking It with Kunkel again.